Hey there, Zlatko here. Welcome to What Is My Brain podcast. Thanks for tuning in. I get the opportunity to chat with fellow founders and business operators about their journey and how they got to where they are now, where they are going and how they're going to get there. I'm planning on bringing guests and touching on topics such as running multiple businesses, executing ideas, and just spitballing about random topics and current events. It's a casual conversation, and that will hopefully bring value to anyone that decides to listen. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, Jeb, thank you so much for for finally being on the podcast, man. I've uh, it's funny how this how this works. I I heard you on a podcast. You said some things that I completely connected to. It was the uh, Omer Khan podcast with the SaaS products. Mm-hmm. And I needed to find you, whether it was on Twitter or whatever, and just let you know that, hey, whatever you said on there, going from an agency to a product and all these other things, it hit me a little bit differently. And so um, I just want to say thank you for being receptive to that message and willing to jump on the phone with me a couple of times. So um, I'm really, really glad you're finally here. And uh, I just kind of want to give you the floor and uh, have you introduce yourself and then we can kind of riff, uh, riff on the podcast, man. Yeah, Z, great to be here, and I've really enjoyed getting to know you, and thanks for reaching out. Um, I'm glad you did, and uh, excited to be here. Um, just high level, a little bit of my bio and background, um, a serial entrepreneur, um, did uh, my first business eBay consignment company called Stuffy back in around 2000, and then after that did uh, an auction house, uh, Antique Helper, now Ripley's Auction in, in uh, 2001, 2002. Uh, left that in 2006 to do um, creative agency Smallbox and ran that for 12 years. And then along the way, started a couple of nonprofits, um, including Musical Family Tree, uh, focused on archiving Indiana music. And then uh, the Speakeasy, which was the first co-working space uh, in Indiana. And then uh, started uh, Boardable with some other folks in uh, 2016. And then left uh, Smallbox in 2018 to go full time at Boardable. And just recently, and Boardable is a board management software company. And then uh, recently left Boardable uh, as a CEO uh, just a few months ago, and now operating more as a founder as I rest and recoup and get ready for my next my next thing, whatever that might be. I, I love it. I love it. There's so many it's so many awesome things I want to touch on there. First and foremost, you started an agency when I don't think agencies were very uh, sexy at the time. So I, I want to kind of tap into that. Was that more based on you know the previous businesses that you were doing, and you were just like, hey, I really have this sort of creative space where I can go in and not only help myself but help other clients and different things. I'd love to know a little bit more about that because. I think having sort of that agency and then going into product, um, that's kind of been my path as well. And so I'd love to hear what, what got you to start an agency and and a little bit more about how many people you guys have and, and all that good stuff. Yeah, um, it, you know, it's interesting. We, uh, Joe and I, co-founders of Smallbox, started in a bit of a panic because I was coming from another business and trying to figure out what we were going to do. And um, he and I together had built two websites at that point musical family tree and the one for antique helper. And I was like, wow, this is really fun. We should just do this. And so we really started off as a web dev shop, you know, building uh, websites and we built our own content management system. We called it boxer. And, uh, you know, we, we competed, you know, with a lot of other uh, folks at the time where, where the web was still kind of this new thing. And a lot of companies were just doing their first website. And so we gobbled up a lot of that business and grew and quickly got into marketing, search engine optimization, uh, search engine marketing. And, uh, and then from there, got pulled into design and brand. And, and a lot of other interesting uh, things came from that. Where the company is now, um, it's got a new CEO. My wife ran it for two years. And then, then uh, Meg Lific took, took over about two and a half years ago. And um, uh, it's really focused on a lot of um, really strategic work uh, with branding and websites involved, but um, a lot of facilitation, a lot of design thinking uh, frameworks that they use uh, to, to drive clarity for the organization. And they work primarily with larger institutional organizations, often nonprofits, uh, big, um, you know, universities, uh, museums, et cetera. Um, so 
yeah, the, the journey really was from just building websites to suddenly, you know, discovering, hey, all these other interesting problems to solve, getting a little lost in the woods when it came to marketing, then eventually shedding all that marketing <laughs> stuff and then focusing more on the strategic side of the, the organization, still doing websites, but through the lens of brand more so. Yeah. And did you have a technical background yourself where you were doing some of the development or creative stuff or was it more so you just had sort of the vision and then you had, you know, you hired people to kind of implement that? What, what was the kind of the starting base there? Because I know for myself, it was I was never a developer. I was never a creative. I was a project manager. So I'm always good at moving things around. But I'd love to know wh wh where you started off on that. On that yeah, I'm, I'm not technical really at all. Like I can I can hack a little bit, but um, you know, uh, my co-founder Joe Downey is a technical wizard. He's now Boardable and one of the founders there too. And so he early on he was doing it all. Uh, he was building, he was designing. You know, like the sort of like back of the napkin kind of design. <laughs> uh, and uh, and then as we matured, uh, you know, we brought in more and more folks that had proficiency in, in those different areas. And, and uh, you know, but I've never um, been a designer or uh, a you know, developer. Uh, I certainly hacked a lot in design, you know, along the way. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's been probably a decade since I've touched Photoshop or anything like that. Um, my my skill set is the entrepreneurial side of it, of, of uh, building teams, selling, uh, delivering. Uh, early on, a lot of project management. Um, later on, less of that. Uh, and running the business. And, and that's that remains, you know, one of my, my core kind of strengths, if you will, as an entrepreneur is just getting something up and running. Uh, I'm really good yeah. at that. Yeah. And um, I enjoy doing it quite a bit. And part of what I learned with my last, you know, journey here with Portable is that, that there's different stages of a business and that you kind of learn where your sweet spot is. And, and as you learn that, you, you also learn where you're not as strong. And that, that was learning some of that with Portable. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think that that really uh, hits me differently, too, because for a really long time, um, and I think it was when I listened to your podcast that it really resonated, um, that being able to know where you are and what you're good at at any point um, is really actually a benefit to a business, even though sometimes you feel like, well, I'm, I, you know, I'm the founder, I'm the CEO here, and I should be doing these things. But when you wake up in the morning, and you just don't want to do those things, and you don't feel like you're great at them, um, you know, getting the right people in place to be able to, you know, supplement what what you're not doing and them doing it even better so when at, at what point did you come to that realization with small box to really take that step back was it just solely based on hey i really don't want to i'm not good at this and i realize i'm not good at this or was it partially also maybe some burnout that was like you know what i'm just tapped out from doing this business anymore yeah i think a lot of that was burnout i i was spending a lot of my energy time and the, the organization's resources on going down you know a, n a number of uh you know, rabbit holes. And, and fortunately, one of them turned into Boardable, which was a, a good rabbit hole to have happen. But we, we pursued about a dozen different ideas over the course of the 12 years I was in the business. And, um, you know, we, we were constantly looking for something that could create reoccurring revenue, get us into the mm -hmm. employee engagement space, whatever it might be. We were just we were just always looking for something to get out of that rut of climbing that Sisyphusian hill every single month of hitting payroll and getting those numbers and it felt like you have this great quarter and then next quarter sucks and it's just like i really wanted to build a snowball not have to remake the house every month and and uh <laughs> yeah and and that that was something that finally came together with portable uh and then uh you know we've learned a lot since then of how to run a really efficient agency uh and meg is doing a fantastic job there with Smallbox, and we could talk about that but you know i just i was just exhausted of feeling like there was no, I wasn't building a momentum. You know, I was just, I was just felt like every single month, every quarter, I had to like hack it back up to the, you know, the, the line again. And, and, uh, I wanted to build reoccurring revenue. So that was where a lot of my attention had gone. And I was, I was, I was at the point of a real, real kind of burnout with the agency model. Um, you know, I was, I was really struggling with feeling a little bit held hostage by the, um, clients at times and sometimes by the team. And not in a, not in a, um, you know, it just in the sense of like what they wanted to do, the work they wanted to do and the work that the clients want to done were not always the same thing. And it was like, well, I, I'm trying to like make peace between these two in some degree and, and kind of sell the client on the vision the employees want to do and then sell the employees on the vision the client wants to do. 
it felt like I was in this uh, conflict of interest zone a lot. Um, and, uh, and I just was losing my heart for the work and, um, we got too big, you know, we, we, we should have stayed small. Um, and I mean, we didn't get that big, we up to about 25 people and, and we just had so much overhead and, and also all the distracting things I was getting into all those rabbit holes, uh, really hurt the company. And so when, by the time I was done, the company was not in good, sh- good shape because my energy had been pulled into boardable pretty significantly, significantly. And my, my wife came in and, and, uh, in 2018 and then, you know, did a two year run as CEO and really just cleaned everything up, just kind of got us back on a good footing, got us out of debt. Um, and then really turned the business around and handed it off to Meg and she, through her journey, she's like, Hey, this is not really what I want to do, you know, much longer. And, yeah. uh, you know, like, you know, Hey, I appreciate all you did. And I would say, you know, doing that inside of a marriage is, is not an easy thing. And we actually did our own little podcast series on it. Cause it was like, you know, such a, such a unique experience. Um, but our marriage fortunately survived and, and I think stronger for it, but, um, it, it definitely tested it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I gotta, I gotta, uh, tap in on uh, what are some of the other, you know, you said about a dozen ideas until you kind of came to Boardable. What are some of those ideas that you guys tapped into and you're like, this is the one and then it didn't end up being the one? Like, yeah. what, I mean, I'm sure you have a few of them, but what was one yeah. that you were really like, hey, man, I really hope this one works because I see this helping, you know, the businesses or individual people, whatever that was. What, what mm-hmm. Give me some examples if you have anything at the top of mind. Yeah, we built a tool kind of similar to Slack. Um, we call it Culture Tap, which was really meant to be like an employee communication and engagement tool and got that pretty robust and used it internally, really as our internal communication platform. Uh, but then Slack came along and we saw that, that, that you know, we were kind of like straddling between uh, employee engagement and, and communication. And we just didn't really have a, a product market fit there beyond our own use case. We built a content gathering tool called Wrangle uh, that was all about prepping content to go into a CMS. Um, we built a uh, sales tool called Digital Leave Behind, which were, you know was basically landing pages that you could spin up uh, for sales purposes and also for HR purposes with with hiring. Um, you know, these are a few of the ideas we had you know the significant time into. Uh, and you know, there's a number of other ones that we pursued and kind of didn't even get to the point of, of using it internally. Um, yeah. it, you know, Joe and I really enjoy building together. And so when I got a wild idea or someone else got a wild idea, we would go after it. And sometimes he would spend six months working on something and then we'd scrap it, you know, and that's a, that's a lot of energy that, that didn't go anywhere. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, but it was also looking back on it, the training he needed to build boardable the way he built it and to have that, you know, self-service, you know, easy to use platform, which it, which it which was really what drove our early success. Yeah. Did you, did you have a special feeling when Boardable was up and running and you saw users come on and you, you were like, ah, uh-huh, I think we, we finally got onto something that not many uh, people are doing at the moment. And we have this sort of unique piece of software. Was there a different feeling between that one and yeah. all the other ones that you tried? Portable immediately felt different to me because I, at that point, was a board chair, I think twice, and I had run boards, nonprofit boards without software, and I saw what a problem it was not having a system of record for the organ for the board because the board sort of sits on this island outside of the outside of the business in many cases, uh, and to have everything being done by email and paper and it just was it was a mess. Um, and then once we got it in the hands of some nonprofits, we, so we originally were approached by United way, um, uh, you know, small box has spun off a product company called gravy lab that I was a partner in with Joe and Jason founders of Boardable, and, and, uh, United way say, Hey, can you board us build us a board portal? And we said, yeah, we can, but it's a lot of money. And they said, yeah, we don't really want to spend that money right now. And we said, yeah, we get it because it's a tool, not a product. And you're going to have to keep investing in it. And we looked at the the space and we looked at our own experience with it. So this is really something that needs to be done because everybody out there is more on the enterprise side. There's no self-service affordable solution that doesn't have to have like all the bells and whistles to like solve the problem. And so we uh, we decided let's go for it. We did a six week sprint and Joe built, built it out. Jason did a lot of the, the wireframing, got it out there and validated the product market fit with a bunch of local nonprofits 
and then we scrubbed the whole all the code and rebuilt it from the ground up. Um, and then that that's still the code base we're, we're running from now. And we had our first customers, I think, end of 2016, early 17. And then we brought in funding early 17 and, and started. I was actually, I think, full-time employee number four. I had, had wow. a few people working there before I came on full-time. I was still you know, working on the small box payroll and running that business uh, for most Damn. of 2017. And did you, do you think that you needed investors at the time to really get it to the next level? Or do you think you guys could have bootstrapped it for a little bit longer and, and, and try to grow it that way? We might have been able to bootstrap it longer, uh, but we also saw a market opportunity that required quite, quite a bit of speed for us to really seize on it. And I think that when you think about investment, one of the big things you want to ask yourself is, um, if we go faster, will it really benefit in terms of market share? Or is this something that's that that well, a slow burn works? Um, yeah. And, and I think we were right to take on money because we needed to build a team. We needed to build the product. We needed to build the marketing. We need to have money to spend on marketing. You know, early on, right. it was yeah. really that spend that, that got us those customers. And, um, and, and, and early on, it wasn't that expensive to get customers. The, the CAC, customer acquisition cost has gone up substantially since then. And of course, our offering has become more robust. Now we can charge more. And, different dynamics right now uh, at play. Yeah. Um, but that early uh, you know, period with board management still being kind of a new category, we came into it and we could be pretty disruptive. And we did that. And that really gave us a foothold of getting to that first thousand customers, which is a big metric to, to hit you know, in the first few years. And then that gave us a foundation to, to grow from. I love it. And what what are the, what are some of the marketing tactics that you guys uh, did with the you know use with the money that you got um, that really got you into the into the door with some of these new customers? Like, what were some that really worked for you guys that maybe you didn't even expect them to work that well at that point? Yeah, I mean the the, the big thing that we found worked well for us at the time was Captera. So we were we were going through Captera, the Gartner systems, and we were. Um, you know, finding customers in Australia, New Zealand, and places like that that for for very low acquisition cost, all self service. You know, we didn't really we we had like an intern doing some demos as a sales assist, and I was doing some demos as a sales assist. But you know, our early business was really self service, and I would different I would differentiate between self service and product led. I, I I think we can dig into that if you want to, but we were primarily a marketing driven self service company for the first couple of years of our existence. And then we layered on more of a sales motion there. And, and now we're increasingly, um, you know, sales led with still a self-service minority of, of our business self-service. But um, the, um, the, the overall like trend that we saw was, um, you know, hey, the, there's, there's a lot of early adopters out there that are eager for a solution. They're looking for a solution and we can gobble those folks up and we also made a lot of investments in content. And so we worked with a woman named Julie Perry, who is, in my opinion, one of the very best um, early stage marketers, you know, uh, sort of a one woman wrecking crew with a really good cast of freelancers that she knows and trusts um, and different agencies she's worked with. She came in and she just on a, on a contract basis really built out our marketing uh, uh, team, you know, like, like fractionally and kept our expenses low there and eventually went on to become our VP, then SVP of marketing. And now she's off doing something new, but, um, she really built out our content strategy. We were posting almost a blog a day. We were focused on wow. owning search. We looked at the search dynamic and we said, everyone, uh, everyone in this is just fat and lazy right now. You know, it's like <laughs> they're all, they're all kind of sitting on their hands, you know, and it's like, and I, I knew from the small box experience how powerful organic search could be to drive business. And so we really leaned heavily into owning uh, the organic rankings and, and continue to make investments in that. Um, and that was a big driver of our growth, targeted spends on Cap Capterra, and then increasing our organic rankings and then early stage, you know, automation with um, HubSpot. Okay. Oh, nice, nice. That's a, that's a, that's a good market to hit. HubSpot has a has a great amount of uh, customers, and I'm sure a lot of those people uh, really overlap with what you guys are offering. Well, I, I mean, we were using HubSpot on our end uh, for marketing oh, oh, automation. Oh. Like, right? Like, oh, like, I know, see. Like, I see. Forms on the website, scheduling demos, um, you know, uh, email campaigns with logic in it, you know, like somewhat primitive back then, but 
you know, um, and then we were doing a lot of webinars. We were doing a lot of uh, eBooks. We were partnering with other folks on that, you know, got going on their webinars. So it was, it was a big content play with automation behind it. Once you generate those leads to nurture them into qualified leads, you know, sales qualified leads, product qualified leads. Um, we were using a d- data scientist and a contract on a full-time basis to score the, um, the activity in the product. That gave us a really good understanding of how uh, the product behavior was trending towards conversion and some really good insights there. And um, that, that was definitely a differentiator for us because we were so product-centric uh, in our yeah. approach yeah. compared to the competition, which was so sales-centric. Nice, nice. I love that. And and uh, what what was the big uh, aha moment with the data scientists where you guys were like, we had no idea that people were using you know this <laughs> so much, or they were going through the process of the product this way, or what, what was that? What was yeah. that moment like? You know, I'll 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 keep some of the secret sauce you know out of the public domain, yeah. but um, we found that there were certain behaviors in the product that when a trial customer did those behaviors. They were kind of um, non-intuitive behaviors. They almost always converted into customers, uh, oh. and so so you could you could kind of look for those, and then we were able to score the uh, the trials based upon that, and then have pretty good predictability around revenue. Um, oh wow! And then you know, so that was sort of an early aha for us is being able to get to that predictability around conversion, and then you know know what our ASP is going to be, and then overall what we should expect. And then you, you layer on increasingly layer on sales and bigger and bigger deals. But, you know, early stage, we were just focused on that self-service motion. I love it. And and how quickly did you guys grow from like your first thousand customers to where you, wherever you are now with Boardable? Like how, what was that? Was there like an exponential when you doubled down on the marketing and everything that you guys were doing? Did you guys see an exponential sort of increase in, in customers, you know, over a quicker yeah. span of time or how did that I don't remember the exact dates. I mean, we're around 2000 customers now. Um, but you know, when you, when you go up market, you, you add fewer customers at higher dollars. And right. So you, you, you switch a little bit. Um, and so we hit a thousand customers. I think it was around three or three years or so into the business. Um, and you know, no, there's no doubt about it that, that COVID was an accelerant for us because, so many people were scrambling to um, digitize the board experience. They, a lot of nonprofits were still meeting in person with you know physically printed out board books, mm-hmm. and that immediately was blown up on March fifteenth, whatever it was. And and within weeks, they had to make a change. And so we, what we did, and this was a good move, even though it was a little risky, is that we went from a fifteen to ninety day trial. And we're just like, look, we don't know what's going on with this pandemic. We don't know how it's going to last. But everybody now, as this comes in that wants to try Boardable, gets 90 days to have the full product and and support and service. And we're just here for you guys. And and if you know, we're just going to work with you. And then that worked out well. Um, you know, we we took a, a hit for like three months. You know, in terms of yeah. revenue. Um, but then it, you know, after that, things changed and. Um, and that was that was a good move. So you know we learned a lot from that, and um, uh, you know I think other people in the pandemic, the other companies had similar moves and, and saw that that um, pay some dividends. And and uh, you know people felt like we were taking care of them, and that's what we wanted to do. We're like, look, this is a crazy time. Just get in here, use this. If you find value in it, you can become a customer. But for ninety days, don't worry about it. Right, right. No, that's awesome. I, I I love that, and I think there was a lot of that switch happening with. Uh, I mean, I, I remember even uh, HubSpot. We use them on the on the agency side, and I remember them even opening up like most of their platform, like the billing side of things and uh, uh, quotes and all these other things, saying, you know what, for the next twelve months, this is completely free to everybody, and if they decide to use it down the road, you can continue paying for it or not. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was a really really good marketing. Well, marketing and also like a like a genuine marketing tool, not just even like. Yeah. Hey, we can capture all these customers. So that that's uh, really really awesome. Now, did you guys see? Uh, did you did a lot of those people stick around that ended up going through that ninety day period? And, and ter- yeah, most of them ended up. No, not most. No, I mean, I mean, you know, conversion rate from a trial. If you're you're somewhere between ten and twenty percent, you're in pretty good shape. Um, I don't remember what our numbers were then, but no, they weren't they weren't far from that. Um, you know, uh, 
you know, we, we definitely saw in the product behavior, the folks that we knew or could predict that were going to convert. Um, and we saw a lot of that happen. Um, so, you know, when we hit Q three of last year, we saw a lot of that, I'm sorry, 2020, not last year, a lot of that start to, to come through. Um, and, uh, it was, it, it ended up being good timing cause we ended up doing our series a and Q4. Um, okay. so, you know, everything kind of clicked at that point. And it's always weird to, to, you know, when you talk about this, like, it feels weird to like do well during the pandemic, you know, you're like, but a lot of businesses did, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and not like I could control it. Obviously if I could hit push a button and make the pandemic never happen, I would still make that happen. But, um, you know, you have to live in the reality of what's there and, and uh, that was what was there. And, uh, we, we, uh, recognized that it was an opportunity for growth and, and that, um, that, that brought investment into the business as well. Yeah. Did you guys also see an uptick in your, on the, on the small box side as well, where there was a lot more people coming your way now to, you know, for the, the strategy and the web design and everything else, or did that kind of slow down? No, small box actually, um, had, you know, two of its best years in 2020 and 2021, it's on its way to have a, one of its best years as well. I I, I, get, I attribute that to a few things. One is um, we got small, you know, as the name implies, yeah. we got we got small. You know, Smallbox got down to about six people and focused on on really outsourcing a lot of the non critical pieces of the delivery. So, you know, if we could get somebody who could build the website for us, you know, on a contract built basis, and we focus on the design, the project management, and really the 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 core, I think, thing that Smallbox delivers is that client relationship and that project management with mm-hmm. the quality standards that are that are um, very high. So the, the, we we do we do not deliver bad work, uh, right? And so there's there's a quality level to what what goes through that team, and the team itself is very high quality and, and has very good standards and what they want to do, and then they demand that of anyone they work with. And then they they really do a great job of managing projects. So, you know, in many cases, um, you know, we saw clients leaving, leaning in uh, at Smallbox during that time and, um, and and then new clients coming in the door. Um, I think a lot of people were like, OK, it's time for us to get to those projects. You know, now yeah. that we're, we're all sitting at home and we got, you know, like a little more time on our hands. Let's get some things done. I think we, we benefited from that. And that business has had a very good you know, couple of years. Yeah. And that, that was kind of the same exact scenario with, uh, with my agency too. We were in the e-commerce space and, you know, everyone for the first, like when March hit and the, everything kind of shut down and then people pulled their money back from like any retail stores that they had and they doubled down on e-commerce. I mean, we went, I think grew like 300% over like two months had to hire mm. people. There was all these things going on. And 2021, mm. people were like tripling down on that business. They were like, mm. oh, this is not going anywhere. Like we're yeah. going to be in this place for a very long time. And I think we just saw some, you know, some reality hit with that. Uh, with I don't know if you recently saw the layoffs like a couple of days ago where like Shopify laid off like 10% of their workforce that they hired yeah. during the pandemic because they just overhired and they thought that the e-commerce side of things was just going to jump five, 10 years ahead of time. And that didn't happen. The bet was, yeah. you know, so it's very unfortunate. And it, it kind of hit us in a way as well, because we went and doubled down on everything. We're just like, okay, increase the team. You know, we need more capacity. We need all these things. And then, you know, this starting of this year, just everyone's kind of with the economic downturn and every, downturn and everything, everyone just kind of pulled back again. It was like, uh, yeah, we don't really want to spend that money anymore. And it's just one of those things where I'm like, oh, okay, well, we have all these people on payroll, we have all these expenses, like, we need to figure out a different way to go about this. So there's definitely some reality setting in and recalibrating going on with with a lot of, I think, agencies and, um, you know, service businesses, uh, especially. So it's a pretty crazy time right now. Yeah, that's, I appreciate you sharing that. That that is, uh, I think, in my lifetime, I don't know if there's ever been a period where uh, planning is more challenging than right now. Because, you know, you had the last two and a half years, you just is like, well, we kind of thought that COVID was going to kind of really screw up the economy. Well, it didn't. And part of it was the government dumping, you know, billions and trillions into the, you know, and not just our government, but governments around yeah. the world. Um, and then, um, you know, you saw just just totally different outcomes than expected. You know, you saw this boom 
that happened really, you know, a brief little kind of recession or something, but then boom. And, uh, and then you're like, okay, well, I didn't see that coming now. And now we're, now we're kind of on this other side of it. We're like, well, how big is this going to, this dip going to be? And, and maybe right. it's not going to be that big, or maybe it's going to be years. And it's like, a lot of people are really struggling with planning right now because it's so feels like such an unpredictable, volatile climate um, compared to the relative steadiness of the last, really since 2007, 2008, a pretty steady uh, economy. Exactly. I feel like I think times are more uncertain now than they were like when the pandemic hit. I, that, that's, I feel like the tables have completely turned at this point. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I I completely agree. And I think inflation's a wild card and the global dynamic is a wild card. And I think the, the, the politics in this country and dysfunction that we have at a, a particularly at a federal level is a big wild card. And it's it's a uh, it's hard to know which winds are going to blow when uh, yeah. the, the sense of stability that I think a lot of businesses enjoyed for so long is gone. And so this is a, a season in many cases for entrepreneurs because it's a season of uncertainty. And part of what excites me about the future is that when there is this kind of change, it's a lot, there's a lot of fresh dirt, if you will, to, to grow with. Um, it's not a great season for, for big, big, big uh, sort of entrenched businesses sometimes that don't have the agility to ad- adjust and adapt, but it's a good time for, to be an entrepreneur, in my opinion. Uh, because yeah. there's a lot of opportunity being created at, at the same time there's disruption. There's yeah. Anytime something, you know, like this happens, there's always a different side of it. It's just sometimes, like you said, the, the digging up some of that and seeing what the actual opportunities are, especially when you're an entrepreneur, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's going to be no matter what, you're going to have to swing for the fences and hopefully something sticks. But at the same time, like when you can identify those opportunities, when you've gone through it a couple of times and you'd be like, Oh, like, for example, uh, you know, the people that when, when the whole pandemic hit and a bunch of people went and invested into zoom and they got the whole upside because everyone was on zoom, you know, everyone's buying their product and everyone was using it as became the, you know, the next hot word, like even those little things, not even starting a business, but even identifying some of those opportunities leads you into like, oh, now I can build a business around Zoom and I can build like a little app that's going to make me $10,000 a month, uh, just reoccurring mm-hmm. revenue, just connecting tool to tool and this these different things. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think it's really, really interesting. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm here for all of it. And then just for me, it's like being running an agency and we see a lot of opportunities in the e-commerce space. I'm like, wait, why has nobody done this part? Like, we need to connect these two things together. There's there's value here. So, um, no, I, I think it's I think it's awesome. And um, you know, I I also feel like there's going to be a sense of people now being a little bit more reserved about the actions that they do take. But I think the people that are actually going to win in the long term are the people that are just going to double down and sort of take that risk because they've. You know, even two years ago, we went through it in a, in a similar fashion where things kind of dropped off and they went back up. And it's like, what mm. goes up must come down and the other way around, too. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah. It's going to be an interesting um, season. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so I, I know that recently you had uh, posted a really uh, awesome um, a letter that you were basically pulling yourself out of the CEO role at Boardable um, and you're more in the board, the founder side of things. Um, so I'd love to know what what sort of what sort of led to that and what are, what are your thoughts on what's next and what you may be thinking about and what space are you kind of interested in seeing develop a little bit more? Yeah, um, you know, the, the journey for that really started about a year ago. And I, I did a lot of soul searching. I was working with a, a coach, this great guy, Dave Cashin, who, who I started working with early 2021. And I just been kind of peeling back the layers of fear that often stand between you, yourself and the, and, the, and the next move and the thing you need to do. And, and I was increasingly um, getting to a place of honesty with myself around um, what energized me and what drained me. And also, I was beginning to see more clearly what kind of leader the business needed uh, to scale the way we need to scale, particularly uh, around revenue. And I looked at my resume and experience and, and my talents and gifts, and I said, you know, I don't think it's me. Uh, and I also, I, I, I felt like the more um, operational side of scaling that business was uh, draining for me. Um, I'm definitely more of a pioneer versus a settler, if you will. Uh, and I can do some settling. I certainly have. And, and uh, you know, I think anybody that's an entrepreneur does a lot of everything. But 
I saw that the the leadership we needed for the next stage of the business was somebody that was had been there and done it. To be honest, who had built a business like uh, a, you know what we want to build, which is business that's worth a lot of money and it does a, has a, serves a lot of customers and has a lot of employees and. This is, that's the path that Bordable's on, and it's the right path, and it's a big market opportunity, and there's endless uh, endless business available for that business as it grows. It was, just wasn't me, and um, and I, I felt, um, you know, part of it was turning 50 last year and just looking at my life and saying, hey, you know, I really feel like I'm in my sweet spot, in my genius zone, if you will, when I am starting something or I'm working one-on-one with somebody, like a coaching experience. Uh, or I'm consulting with somebody, um, and sitting in these managerial meetings is, was very draining for me. As much as I love the people in the meeting, I felt like I was untangling this crazy ball of yarn every day, and that was exhausting for me. Another piece was I was really burned out on staring at a screen eight to ten hours a day, um, you know, and uh, I I really didn't want to have my life go that way for much longer because that is not energizing for me to stare at a screen and talk and talk into a microphone all day long. Um, that's not the human experience I want to have at this point in my life. Um, I recognize the necessity for it at times. Fortunately, we had somebody in the business that was really poised to step in and had been kind of preparing for the, this role for a long time. And that's Jeff Middlesworth, who was our chief product officer and had joined the business about two and a half years earlier and been a consultant before that and uh, with us advisor and just really knew the business and he was an early guy at Exact Target, like built the original product, went all the way through the Salesforce acquisition. Uh, it was a senior leader there, then went into chief product officer at Emma, saw them through an acquisition. So he really knew how to scale the revenue side of a business, especially a product centric business like us, and knew, knew everybody in the team and had my trust and had the board's trust and confidence. And so him and Andy Clark, who's one of the co-founders and COO there, I saw as the right team to really scale us. And I'm still involved. You know, I, I'm, I'm pretty active as a founder um, coming in and, and helping out where I can, but I don't have an operational role in the business. And so I'm starting to look more at what's next. Um, you know, I've got a bunch of ideas um, and I've, I've been kind of beating them around and, 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 and uh, seeing what, what makes sense. But um, I'm intentionally not making any decisions for, for a while, probably not till October, because I really don't want to just jump into something else like I have in the past. I want to make sure that I'm really operating, um, you know, from the, 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 the space of, of caring about what I do a lot and caring who I do it with and how I do it. And really, the, the what is less important to me increasingly than the, the who and the how. Um, and so I'm spending a lot of time talking to people and just seeing who the who is and, and, and then the talking about how we want to do things. And then, OK, what kind of problems do we want to solve? Uh, I don't I don't know exactly what it's going to be. I have ideas, you know, in a number of spaces um, and most of them are spaces that I personally engage with. And that's something like with Boardable, where I, I personally was engaged with the board experience. I, I think the best entrepreneurial experiences are where you're solving your own problem. Um, that's where you have the most success. So I don't want to just go out and solve just any old problem. I want to solve a problem that I, I have and I care about. But uh, I don't know exactly what that is yet. And, and maybe I'll take a year and just do some consulting and coaching and not do the CEO gig for a while. I, I, I don't know. I, I was pretty burned out. You know, I didn't I didn't recognize how burned out I was until I got away from it. I think it takes a lot uh, for somebody to recognize that space that they're in. And I think for myself, I, I kind of got to that point last year, too. And so just hearing you talk about that, um, it, it's it sounds to me and I don't know, like through the coaching thing or if you do, you know, therapy on the side and things like that. It sounds like while you were sort of in the day to day and you're going through this, you also maybe set aside some time for yourself to start figuring out like what's actually burning you out. And I don't think a lot of people, especially in the tech space, because things are moving so quickly, get that time to do that. And I think the whole, you know, notion of doing therapy and all this now has become very amplified in a really good way, in my opinion, um, where people are taking that a little bit more seriously and recognizing where they are looking around a little bit more rather than just being 100% tunnel focused. And so um, I think there's a lot to learn for people that are even up and coming entrepreneurs, you know, somebody like yourself that has been able to build up, you know, 
couple different companies and businesses in the past and come to, you know, at age 50 to be like, you know what, like, as as much as this can become like somewhat of a comfort zone, I'm ready for the new thing. I'm ready for something else. And I don't want to rush it. Like, I just want to take my time. And there's going to be always opportunity out there for an entrepreneur to find something that say, ah, that actually is one of these small problems that I have, but I'm going to go out and take care of that. And maybe that's just a smaller component of your, of your uh, business or your entrepreneurial career, but it's actually something that actually satisfies you. And I think that's really, really important to tap into because I think a lot of people, including myself, I mean, you and I have talked and burnout is a really, it's a real thing and you almost don't recognize it until it happens. And for you mm-hmm. to be in a place now to recognize it before it gets to that point. And even, you know, you might be at a burnout stage, but getting to that point where you just feel like you're crumbling, um, I think that's huge. And I just want to give you, you know, major props for recognizing that and keeping your keeping yourself healthy from that perspective. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that, Z. And I, you know, one thing that um, really helped me during that season was, you know, I, I think we talked about this before, about I do a week alone every every year in the woods at a cabin and um, do a lot of reflection and writing and thinking and music. And, um, you know, I about a, about a year ago this time, I, I did that. And um, and that was where a lot of a lot of the clarity came to me, where I, I had more confidence in moving this direction that that was taking me out of the day-to-day of the business. Um, I think there's two kinds of progress. And I think you kind of spoke to it a little bit there. There's, there's linear progress and that's, that's sort of the hustle progress uh, where you're, you're, you're working, you're, you're, you're cranking, you're putting in long hours and you can make that linear progress and you may, you can burn, you can burn your own fuel, you know, uh, you know, mm-hmm. a little bit too much, you know, you can kind of burn down the candle if you will. Um, and then there's like quantum progress, and that's where you're actually often not in the activity of the business or or the project or whatever it is in your life. You're outside of it, and you're suddenly seeing things that you didn't see before, and you're making connections you didn't make, and uh, you're also letting go, in my experience, of things that you held very tightly out of fear or out of whatever concern you might have, and you're willing to like envision a different future and you can start to see how that future comes together and you start telling yourself a different story that's quantum progress like when you start rewriting the script because then Mm -hmm. things start materializing and i mean this sort of life in the universe starts to bring things to you because what you're attracting the law of attraction changes um, because you're now telling yourself a different story and that story is manifesting and appearing in your life that kind of quantum progress only really happens when you step aside from the linear activity progress. And that linear activity progress is very addictive because it's constantly being reinforced with, hey, you know, I answered 10 emails, ding, 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 you know, in your brain, you know, dopamine. Chemicals. Yeah. And, and then, you know, oh, I just closed another deal, ding, ding, ding. Meanwhile, you know, you're, you're losing out on the quantum leap you could potentially make if you were to re- go pull back reset things, get past the fears you have of change and start to write a new story. And that new story then shows up in your life. Yeah. And, and I can't tell you how much I relate to that because that place. Uh, so, so two things on that. Um, I heard a really good, uh, uh, somebody wrote this somewhere a quote or something that says, you know, uh, uh, you get, you build a machine, you build that business and most founders don't need to be and CEOs don't need to be inside of the machine. That's where you hired the best people to, to, to operate that machine. We need to work on the outside of the machine to make the machine overall better in one way or another. And that's that step back that you're taking. You know, you're looking at it from a, from a different level, different perspective, where you're now seeing opportunities outside of that little machine that you've built. Because when you're in the machine, you don't see anything from the outs- on the outside. Because yeah. you're every day just grinding away, grinding away, grinding away. Screw loose here, tighten it up, tighten it up, tighten it up. When you're on the outside, you're like looking at it as like, no, this thing's actually working. Like now we can go here. Now we can do that. So that really uh, resonated with me when I and, and it really changed my mindset about even just running the way I run my agency and the way I run any of these apps and things that I'm building is, you know, got to got to let people put people in position to do their best work. And then you go out and you go do 
the work that they're not doing, which is like the bigger picture stuff. And, you know, biz, whether it's like more business development or stuff like, hey, I just came up with a new idea that we can throw in here. And what do you guys think about this? And really having that collaborative, because when everyone's in the same in the same space, it's very hard to, you know, turn. You're almost mm-hmm. like just kind of sitting there. And so um, and, and, and the other part of it is that I want to touch on that you said is like uh, kind of about your next moves is really solving your own problems first. And a couple of the things that, you know, my team's working on on the products, you do, that's literally where every single idea has come from. It's like, oh, I have this problem. How many other people, is there, it, first of all, is there, is there a solution out there that I don't know about? Do a couple of Google searches and it's like, nope, there's nothing out there. Why is there nothing out there? Let me talk to five people that I know that are maybe in the same space. Oh, you guys need the same exact thing? That to me is validation right there that if I could build it for five people, there's probably five others and maybe five others after that. And even if it's just 20 people, I've solved 20 people's problems and that's going to derive another idea that's going to solve the next 20, next 40, next 60, and then expand that way. And that's kind of how I've been thinking about SaaS. And so my goal has recently been to tap out of you know the service side of the uh, world because I feel like I could solve much better and more effective problems for people that actually can use these tools like you did with Boardable versus me just building another e-commerce website for somebody to you know run you know that sort of thing like that that part of my life I've already sort of like conquered and burned out on and I just need to kind of go to the next step. Yeah, yeah, I think it's very hard to get out of that flywheel of activity, especially when you have the pressures of payroll. And, yeah. and and deadlines and things like that, and I think that it's important to give yourself the grace to 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 show up imperfectly in the business yeah. and to be like, oh, no, that's a good one. I'm gonna up. keep that. I'm keeping that one. <laughs> show up imperfectly. I'm keeping that one. <laughs> yeah, and just be like, you know what? I didn't get there today. I didn't get there today, and that's okay. I forgive myself. I let it go, and then tomorrow. You know, I did a little better today. Still got caught up in the flywheel. Still found myself doing some project management, cleaning up a mess. You know, one of the things I think it's hard as a CEO of of an entrepreneurial CEO, particularly, the business started with you doing everything, you know, or a lot of it. Yep. And so as you grow, losing those habits around coming in and plugging every hole and solving every problem, you know, um, and letting balls drop, right? And letting problems lay in plain sight, which is something I think a lot about, and being comfortable mm-hmm. with that, and saying, you know what, I'm gonna let this problem sit there. It's gonna, it's just gonna sit there for a while, and uh, not sure if anybody else is gonna notice. But I'll tell you what, if you don't do that, then you build a team that's increasingly dependent upon you, not dependent upon each other, to move the business forward. And you want to decrease their dependence upon you because to really serve that business. You need to move from that activity zone to that more strategic zone. And a lot of people get stuck in that, uh, in that, that flywheel. Oh, I can raise my hand on that one every single time. Like that's literally uh, wearing five different, 10 different hats in the beginning and then trying to delegate and still keeping like, is it going to, are they going to do it right? Are they going to, you know, having that, that sort of uh, mindset of never really wanting to trust everybody and giving autonomy but still like peeking over the fence and, hey, th- was it was it done the way I would have done it? Or was it done better? Or was it done worse? What could have changed? Like there's these questions. And um, yeah, I think showing up imperfectly, that's that that really strikes a chord. And um, I, I think that's that's a really, really good way of putting it. Now, through your through your sort of coaching, uh, you know, you did you said you did about a year of that. Um, what was it just more the burnout that led to that? Or was it just more like, hey, I need to really start talking to somebody about my next steps and, and where I'm fitting in and where I'm not fitting in. Was that kind of the, the, the key to it or was it more just like burnout led me to this like coaching thing? It was, it was more uh, what I saw was needed for me to get to the next level as a leader. And so after mm-hmm. the series a, the board was supportive of me working with a coach. So I sought that person out and started working with them. I think in March Dave, I started working in March of that year after talking to a few people, and, and I'm so glad I chose Dave. He was a great fit. It was not to like coach me out of the business or anything like that. It was right. actually helped me, you know, elevate as the business grew. It just so happened that it also came to a point where I had the awareness that the change needed to happen, both for me and for the business. And it just it was really kismet that it all came together with Jeff being the right person to come in and 
the timing and everything else. But, um, you know, a lot of it was just working through the fear, uh, the, the fear of how that might appear, the fear of letting go, the fear of not feeling, you know, like going from solid to soft ground, if you will. Um, and, uh, you know, just getting to the point where I could be comfortable with that and where I could write another story and where I, where the stories that I had, I could question and challenge, um, because they had become so dominant in my head. And th- th- there's lots of reasons why, but, um, you know, that was super, super helpful for me. And I, I think every CEO should be working with a coach, you know, just that, that the ability to have somebody who can help them, you know, really see and hear their stories more objectively of why they Mm -hmm. can't let that person go, why they can't um, make that decision. That's so hard to make, why they can't um, reach out to that person for help, whatever it is, you know, all these things that that we are held back by out of fear Um, and appreciating that the fear is trying to help us, but that it's not necessarily doing its job in the right way at, at this time. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. That's a really good way of putting it. And I also do want to touch on what you told me on one of our previous calls is, uh, you know, when you're uh, when you're going through through these tough times and, you know, I shared with you about my agency and all these other things is like in that moment. And it's always easier, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, But like when you're in that moment, really grasping that as like that's propelling growth in one way or another. You may not see it now, but that's something that those are stepping stones that are being built right now and it's always the building process is always the hardest one but that's part of the whole journey is like going through these storms weathering that storm and then moving into more like sunshine and 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 you know happiness type of thing and that really really stuck with me because it's it's very hard to be in the place of recognizing that and seeing like oh uh i cannot think of anything else right now but working and trying to get out of this thing or whatever it is and why am i so stressed out all the time why am i affected mentally by by so much of this stuff and um yeah i i think that was that really stuck with me and i want to say thank you for embedding that into my head because every time now i run into a even if it's a small issue it's like okay well this is going to lead to something let's let's just either take care of it or let it sit there bring it with you and 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 go through the process so thank you for that oh thank you appreciate that and yeah, you said it. You, you put it, you put it very nicely there. <laughs> um, so, what what are some things on the on the personal side that now that you've kind of stepped away from a lot of the day to day? What are you doing to you know, I guess, take care of yourself or or find these places where you get some of your ideas and figuring out what you might want to move into? Are you doing you know, are you going on bike rides every day? Are you what what are some of those things that are really like? you know, enjoyable to you right now that you find a lot of time for, you know, creative thoughts Mm. and things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, meditation is really the foundation of my mental health practices. Uh, Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I look to begin every day with it, um, end every day with it often in the middle of the day, I'll, I'll just take a break and do five or 10 minutes. Um, you know, I think about, uh, my center of consciousness being at the bottom of the ocean and that the, at the top, there's all these waves and some, some days there's a storm, some days it's calm. But if I have my seat of consciousness is more the, the floor of the ocean, then I can have awareness around those changes and storms. But uh, my peace and calm remains where it is, um, despite the, the tumult, tumult and change in the world. And sometimes it's pretty intense. And a lot of times I do get caught up in the waves and I, yeah. I identify identify with the wave more than the floor, if you will. Um, But keeping my seat of consciousness more there in this place of calm uh, and peacefulness is a lot of my practice. And so that involves meditation, bike rides, hikes, walks, just went to infrared sauna before I did this, Um, you know, some yoga, uh, conversations like this um, really are meaningful for me, one-on-one conversations. Um, where, there, you know, I, I always look to be uh, uh, heart-centered in my interactions with people. Uh, I find that there's th- three levels of interaction that I experience. One is transactional, and that's sort of your typical, like, you know, fast food, buying something kind of thing, or, or like, you know, in a project, like, we got to get this done. This tra- it feels transactional. Uh, and then there's the heart-centered uh, conversations, which is where you're opening up, you know, on that level, and you're having that connection where you feel that care and warmth between people. And then I think the third, which is more rare, but 
but really powerful is a soul level connection of where you are not talking even as the personas of Jeb and Z. You're, you're talking more on a soul level of like, what's it like to have this human experience, right? Which is such mm -hmm. a fascinating experience to have. So those are the three levels. So, you know, I try to really focus on the heart level because that's the level that I feel I can get to the easiest. Um, and I practice on staying open hearted. And my goal is to live that way as much as possible going forward, no matter what I do. Um, I will always have some tr transactional pieces to my life. And I mm -hmm. always hope there's soul level, you know, relationships. And there certainly are quite a few. Um, but that heart piece is where I, where I, I, I do a daily practice to keep my heart open and not close it off out of fear, you know, out of feeling threatened by whatever yeah. life's got going on. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. That's a, that's a really good, uh, a good, really, really good mind frame to be in and, and constantly be thinking about that. And, and if that's where your energy is going, it's a good place to go for it to go because you're, you're, like you said, you're keeping your heart open. So uh, that's amazing, Jeb. Um, and thank you for sharing all that. Cause I think those are a lot of things, hopefully whoever listens to this and, you know, people struggling all the time with running a business, starting a business, you know, trying to do whatever they're doing and getting out of a nine to five and starting something. And um, I think it's, it's really important to kind of keep a lot of that stuff in mind as you go through some of these uh, tougher times. And so uh, I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, is there anything anything else that, you know, uh, strikes a chord that you want to chat about? I know we're coming up on an hour here. Um, but I, I, I'm really curious to see if there's anything else or, or do you feel like we, we were, we were able to touch on a lot of this stuff? Yeah, it's been a great conversation. We, we touched on a lot of stuff. I think, you know, the, the one thing that, that I would just share is how important it is to be patient with yourself, to, to love yourself, to forgive yourself, to release judgment of yourself, um, and to accept that you're not perfect, um, that perfection is not the goal, you know, uh, wholeness is the goal and those are different things. And, um, yeah, I think that, uh, if we can live lives that, that are uh, present, whole, open-hearted, um, imperfect, you know, lives that where we struggle, lives where we don't always end the day feeling like we check the boxes or made the progress we want loving kind lives i think that then the work that we do um will have meaning to it but the real meaning and purpose that i find in life is with the people i spend time with um and work is in many cases for me just an excuse to spend time with people i really care about and one of the <laughs> ahas i had recently was that projects are kind of my love language you know like like i i use projects as a way to spend time with people that i love um whether it's music whether it's you know a business or something in the community a nonprofit. if i care about somebody it's it's been really great to find projects with with old friends new friends and then they that brings them into my life and i've got a friend uh, this evening i'm meeting to work on a project i've got a friend staying with me this weekend to uh, work on a project. And, and that's really a fun thing for me. So that's just something to put in your head if it's, if it's helpful. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's a, that's a perfect place to, to end this. And uh, I, I really just want to kind of close it off by saying uh, thank you for your, for your time and for being on here and sharing your wisdom and your experiences and, you know, your learnings and your journey and all that stuff. Um, I'm, I'm really hopeful that it'll, I, I know it's helped me from the two conversations we had prior to this. And then all, on top of everything, just understanding, you know, everything that you talked about on the podcast today. So I just sincerely want to say thank you. And, and uh, like I said, thank you for responding, because when you did that other podcast, it really uh, I, I was just having so many aha moments and so many moments where I was like, I can relate to that. Oh, my God, he's kind of on the same journey. And so that was really, really refreshing to hear, because honestly, I had no idea uh, about you. I had nothing. I literally went on that podcast. I saw it pop up in my feed and I just selected a random episode. And um, I never went back to that podcast, to be honest, after I connected with you, I was like, well, I need to go back to it. But that was the only episode that I listened to and uh, got to connect with you. So I just want to sincerely say thank you, Jeb. I'm so glad you reached out. It's been a joy to get to know you, Z. And I'm sure we'll have many more conversations to come. And 
Thanks for having me on. This has been great. Amazing. I appreciate it. And good luck with everything else you get into, whatever that is, whether it's in October or next year or whenever it is, uh, I'll be rooting for you from, from over here for sure. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. Well, you made it to the end of the episode. Thank you so much for tuning into What Is My Brain podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you got some value out of it. Make sure you hit the subscribe button or the follow button to get notified when new episodes are live. I'm out. Thank you.